All right, this is the first lecture for uh, pneumatology. This is an in introduction to pneumatology. I'm Richard Raines, and this video is um, being presented to students at Elam Bible Institute and College uh, for the course Theology 3. So in order to really get an understanding of uh, pneumatology um, as a as a part of systematic theology. So when you when you think about Christian theology, um, typically what we do, especially in the evangelical church, is we break up the various elements of theology um, into categories so that we can more easily understand them. And when we use the term systematic theology, uh, what we mean is, is that we take an issue in theology. So for instance, what we're doing in this course, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we say, okay, what does the Bible have to say about the Holy Spirit in every single instance? And then we develop a theology. But we also look at what has the Christian church traditionally taught about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And we build that entire theology. And then we look at other historical uh, time periods uh, throughout the history of Christianity, and we build that into our theology. And so we do that with with all the elements of theology. If we're looking at the doctrine of Jesus, it's Christology. If we're looking at the doctrine of the last things or the last days, that's eschatology. And so what we'll do in this course is by the end of this course, um, we'll have built uh, a case for a very good understanding of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so what tonight, uh, this lecture rather, is all about, it's about developing a, an early understanding so that we kind of know where we're going and looking at um, some, of the, you know, some of the activity, particularly in the, in the book of Acts. So uh, the first thing for our purposes here tonight to understand about the Holy Spirit is even though we will have lectures on how the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament, how the Holy Spirit operated in the Gospels and in Pauline letters and, and that sort of thing, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, from, from our perspective as New Testament Christians, as evangelical Christians, um, we, we tend to, to start our conversation about the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts rather than in the Old Testament. That's not wrong or right. That's just typically what we do since we are um, we consider ourselves New Testament followers of God. And so one of the things to remember about the early church is that the early church was a charismatic community. Now, the term charismatic is a little bit of a charged term, because typically when people think charismatic, they think, you know, large churches with, you know, flags and tambourines and really exuberant worship. Um, some people that don't understand the differences between Pentecostal and charismatic may think that charismatic means Pentecostal. That's fine. Um, th there may even be some other elements that people associate with charismatic. They may think about maybe the prosperity gospel, or they may think about um you know, faith healers or, or things like that. But in theology proper or particularly in, in historical theology or the history of Christianity, when we use the term charismatic, we don't mean it quite like the, the contemporary understanding. So when, so when I say that the early church was a charismatic community, um, we get the word charismatic from, from a couple of different words. Um, the Greek word for grace is charis. You would spell that in English, C-H-A-R-I-S. The word for divine gift is charismata. So when we use the term charismatic, or when I say that the early church was a charismatic community, what I mean is that from the time Jesus ascended, really beginning in Acts chapter 2 and all throughout the book of Acts, all throughout the ministry of Paul and Titus and Timothy and all throughout Peter and John's ministry and all the other disciples, apostles, 
So when we say that the early church was a charismatic community, we say that the early church was a community that was defined, at least in part, by gifts of divine grace. Now, the book of Acts is, it is the best source on the planet for what the very first generation of Christians looked like. And the picture we get uh, from Acts is that the early church was charismatic. So I'm going to read a passage in Acts. We're going to go to Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 42, and read to the end of the chapter. And then we're going to talk about seven different things that that reveal the early church. What, what defined the early church? So let's read uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 42. And um, throughout this course, unless I, unless I say differently, uh, I'll be reading from the ESV. Uh, the English Standard Version. Acts 2.42 And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, bread and the prayers, and all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So we see seven different things in that passage that give us a clear picture of how to define the early church. The first, they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. That's doctrine. So the early church. The, the first generation of Christians set a standard that Christians would have to follow until Jesus returns. And that is that one of the primary identifiers of a New Testament church is that that church is devoted to the teaching of the apostles. Now, for for all practical purposes, what that means is that means that as Christians, we are devoted to the teaching of the 66 books that make up the Old and New Testament canon, particularly the New Testament. So the first thing the, the New Testament church was defined by was that they were dedicated to the teaching of the apostles. Secondly, was fellowship. You read in this passage that they were together. They didn't just show up one day a week and pat each other on the back and pretend like everything was great and lie to each other about how they were really doing. They were together. They spent time together. They were as close or closer, really, than family. Um, the other thing that defined them was communion. It says here that the breaking of the bread and prayers. The breaking of the bread and prayers, that's communion. And prayers is prayer. So they were defined by the, devoting, the devotion to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. The early church prayed, prayed together, prayed alone, prayed out loud, prayed in public prayed in private. So they were a group that prayed. Uh, fifth, uh, they were defined by gifts and operation of the Spirit. And really, that's kind of our, um, our focus for this semester. But it's really important that, that if you've never really studied the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and or you've never really studied uh, the history of Christianity, it's really important that you get a really good picture of of the reality that the early church operated in the gifts of the spirit now we'll spend a lot of time this semester talking about what those are but just to kind of give you a preview the the christians in the new testament in the book of acts the first generation of christians prophecy was a part of was an everyday part of of their existence prophecy and healings tongues miracles signs wonders like it was it was commonplace for them and so you, you really can't talk about the early church without talking about these d divine manifestations of the spirit that accompanied them in their worship gatherings and when they would interact with gentiles or or, or non-believers or, or jews 
And so that's that's really a big part. And that's that's number five. Number six, um, the other thing that defined the early church was that was that they met the physical needs of the less fortunate. I'm not going to get to it get into it in this class, but um, taking care of of the less fortunate was not a was not an add on. And it wasn't something they did if they had time and if they had resources. And it's important that, that we understand this for our church today. But when it comes to taking care of the less fortunate, there, there wasn't really a, a differentiating factor for them regarding whether or not they felt like they had the time or the resources. They, you know, the early church would never say we're too busy doing communion to take care of the widows. They would never say, well, we, you know, we've got choir practice on Wednesday nights. We can't take care of the orphans because of choir practice, right? It was as much as a devotion to the apostles and as much as the gifts of the spirit were integral to the life of the early church. So was taking care of the physical needs of the less fortunate around them. That's number six. And number seven was salvations. Conversions to Christianity um, accompanied the early church. So devotion to the teaching of the apostles, that's one, two, fellowship, three, communion, or Lord's Supper, four, prayer, five, gifts, um, and operation of the spirit, six, meeting the physical needs of the less fortunate, and seven, salvations. So regarding this number five, this gift and operations of the spirit, um, if we if we go back to to Acts chapter one verse eight, we'll just read that really quickly. This is the words of Jesus. Um, we'll just start with with verse six, um, chapter one in Acts verse six. So when they had come together, they asked him, "Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of restore the kingdom to Israel?" He said to them, "It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority." In verse eight. But you will see, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So in Acts one eight, and further, right? He he tells them to to go to Jerusalem, go wait in Jerusalem. And his instructions to the first Christians was to go wait for the inauguration. Of the charismatic gifts, which was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And if you haven't read Acts chapter 2, I encourage you to read it. You'll really need it as a foundation for a lot of the things we're going to talk about in this course. But in Acts chapter 2, um, there was a shift in how the Holy Spirit operated in the life of God's people. And we're going to explore that when we talk about the the Holy Spirit's operation in the Old Testament versus the New Testament. That's a that's a lecture we'll do. This is really just an introduction to get you thinking about. So, so this this idea that the early church was a charismatic community really followed the church for a few hundred years, but something happened in the history of Christianity in 312 that that really shifted the focus of, of Christianity. In 312, the Emperor Constantine uh, was converted to Christianity. Up until Constantine's conversion, Christianity was an illegal religion. It wasn't persecuted nonstop, but there was persecution that took place of Christians. Christians were, you know, put into the gladiator arenas. They were put into the, to the arenas with, uh, with lions. Uh, Nero actually, um, uh, chained uh, Christians to poles and set them on fire to provide light for a party. So, so there was definitely persecution of Christians. It wasn't like this nonstop persecution that maybe some people think, but but then suddenly the emperor becomes a Christian, and then suddenly, in just a matter of you know almost overnight, not really, but but really quickly, um, it became sort of avant garde to be. To be a Christian, and if the emperor is Christian, then if we want political power, if we want to be close to the emperor, then we should become Christians as well. So, so after 312 and after 318 and 325, those were a couple of ecumenical councils. You begin to see uh, the 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 charismatic gifts of the Spirit begin to wane 
in the life of the church. And, and really, um, it's, it's a slow leak until about the 5th century. And from about the 5th century um, on, um, you really don't see as many of those charismatic gifts. One of the reasons for that is that the, the church, in, in light of Constantine being converted to Christianity, in light of that, um, the, the church, some of the pressure on the church from society, right? It's an, it's an illegal religion. Now the emperor's a Christian. So, so now the, the Christian church is not so focused on trying to defend its position. There may not be as big of a need to defend its position, but what the church does in light of Constantine's conversion is they began to deal with various heresies that had come up. And so um, as, as the focus on defending Christianity outward turned into a focus on developing doctrine inward, we see less of an emphasis on the charismatic gifts. There was also a real big emphasis on getting church government right, because remember, the emperor becomes a Christian. Suddenly, everybody wants to be a Christian. You got all these people that want to be baptized and join the church, and that poses a very significant challenge for the early Christians, because number one, where are we going to put all these people? Number two, we don't have enough you know, pastors. Uh, we don't have enough um you know, we don't have no resources. We don't even really have enough places to baptize all these people. So the church begins to have to develop um, a system of government for that. And so when you're kind of focused on, you know, you know, over here trying to get doctrine right and and combat heresy, and over here you're trying to make sure that the church government reflects what the New Testament teaches um, from a doctrinal perspective. Really, you just see less of an em emphasis on the charismatic gifts. So right doctrine and right practice took the place of the charismatic gifts. But fast forward to really the 18th, 19th century, 20th century, um, you begin to see a renewed focus, a renewed interest in pneumatology. Probably the the greatest event to really reveal an interest in pneumatology uh, was the Pentecostal revival of the 20th century. That really brought a, a renewed interest because remember, you really had charismatic gifts up into the fifth century. Then after the fifth century, you really just don't see it very often. And then seemingly out of nowhere, in 1896, you had a group of Christians in Western North Carolina that um, at Shearer Schoolhouse that experienced the very first modern day Pentecostal revival. A group of people began speaking in tongues at Shearer Schoolhouse revival. And then in 1906, really the, the event that catapulted global Pentecostalism, which was the Azusa Street revival. And so what's very interesting is that you know, prior to 1896, there, there was virtually zero Pentecostals in the world. There was there was no tongues. There was no interpretations. There was no signs and wonders and healings. Not none, but you know what I mean. It's uh, virtually non-existent. There's really, you know, non-existent prophecy, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so you have this you have this Pentecostal revival that is launched in 1896 and then really in 1906, where suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, you have tongues and interpretations and prophecies and healings and all these, you know, New Testament book of Acts things, book of Acts things. And one of the interesting things about the modern Pentecostal revival is that prior to 1896, there was virtually zero Pentecostals on the planet. And less than a hundred years later, there were over 400 million Pentecostals where, where we are today is that Pentecostals make up roughly one third of all Christians on the planet. It's the largest expression of, uh, of Protestant Christianity. And it is really the only branch of Christianity that's growing worldwide. And so because of all that, you have this renewed interest in pneumatology because you have all these non-Pentecostal 
uh, faith traditions, Roman Catholics, um, Anglicans, uh, Episcopals. Episcopals were actually the very first charismatic group. Um, Episcopals in the 60s, 50s and 60s began experiencing some of these uh, spiritual gifts in their services and the Episcopals became the, the very first charismatic community um, in the United States. Um, and so, so you've got this, this really, this, this renewed interest um, based primarily on the Pentecostal revival. But there's a couple of other reasons why there's a renewed interest in, uh, in pneumatology. Um, among those churches that are, that are less open to um, either exuberant worship or, you know, spiritual gifts, you know, they begin to be surrounded by people who, who are experiencing these, these, these spiritual gifts and this renewal and this revival. And so you've got these academics and you've got these people in these mainline churches that don't want to leave their churches, but they want to know more about the Holy Spirit. So among those scholars, Anglican scholars, um, Lutheran scholars, um, you begin to, to notice that, that they begin to sort of protest this impersonal and bureaucratic nature of their faith and begin pursuing a more spirit-centric faith. And so in, among those churches, you begin to see um, quite a bit of interest. Um, and they recognize that in this modern age, really the, the tools that they have been given to deal with a modern age are really insufficient um, when you think about the spiritual warfare uh, that's taking place. Um, liberal churches um, in the 60s and 70s really became burned out on political activism. And so you had liberal churches um, that were interested in spiritual renewal as a way to um, sort of keep the fires of fervor burning in their congregation. Because really what you see in large cities, particularly in the inner city, um, Presbyterians and Methodists and Episcopals, um, you begin to, you know, those churches are, are, very liberal in their theology. And when people become burned out on, you know, attending rallies and, and protesting everything they can think of protesting, um, these churches began to develop an interest in the Holy Spirit as a way of, of renewing their congregations. Um, because what they had relied on maybe up to that point was was sort of this social activism to keep everyone renewed. And so there just became a general interest. Okay, how does the Holy Spirit fit into our liberal theology? And then um, Karl Barth, who we'll talk about uh, later in, in this in this course, um, he really did a job, a good job in the 20th century of renewing everyone's interest in how the Holy Spirit um, operated in the Old Testament. And I'll, I'll lecture on that um, in a couple of weeks. And so that'll be an interesting lecture. I always enjoy uh, that lecture. But, but what we want to do in this course is we want to develop an orthodox pneumatology. Now, orthodox literally means straight or proper. So when we say orthodox, what we want to do is we want to develop a, a doctrine of the Holy Spirit that is straight or aligned with what the Bible says, that is aligned to the historical doctrines and is aligned to what we see with our eyes. One of the things that's very important uh, that we understand about studying the Spirit, studying the Holy Spirit, is um, when, um, I forget where it is in, in Acts, but but Peter and John were locked up and they were locked up because they were they were preaching and they were healing in Jesus name. The Jews got mad and said, hey, you got to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter answered, look, we can only tell you what we've seen and heard. And then later, Peter would write what we have seen and heard. We declare unto you. And in second Peter, I think it's first or second Peter, he says we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So there is this experiential element to uh, to the Holy Spirit that informs that doctrine. It's not the 
the chief component, but it's certainly um, one of the legs that a doctrine of pneumatology stands on. So when thinking about developing an orthodox pneumatology, we want that, that orthodox pneumatology to consist of at least three different elements. Number one, an orthodox pneumatology will be rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Israel, in the ministry of Jesus, and in the life of the early church. So it's rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit in Israel, Jesus, and the church. Number two, an orthodox pneumatology will be rooted in the history, will be rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. The Holy Spirit is active in salvation, in justification, in uh, the reality of the kingdom now, the reality of the kingdom to come, right? So it's, it's active in salvation and it's active in the hope that that salvation brings. And third, the third element of an orthodox pneumatology, and we'll do our best in this course uh, to do that, is that an orthodox pneumatology will be rooted in the Trinity. It is a, we will have a Trinitarian understanding of God. The members of the Holy Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, are not to be understood as separate selves living in isolation of each other. Rather, their their personhood is constituted by their relationships with each other. That's uh, one of my favorite theology books is Daniel Migliori. That, that's a quote by, by Migliori. So what we will strive for in this course over, you know, 15 weeks, 16 weeks, is we will strive to develop an orthodox pneumatology that is built on, number one, the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Israel, the life of Jesus, and the life of the church. Number two, uh, an orthodox pneumatology that's rooted in the work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. And number three, um, an orthodox pneumatology that is rooted in a Trinitarian understanding of God. And so um, that really wraps up an introduction. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out.